Welcome back to these lectures on American history. Uh, this is lecture number 24. I'm going to characterize the Jacksonian era uh, here in the, uh, the early republic. Uh, there's an economic takeoff in the United States, uh, sometimes referred to as the market revolution. Uh, so this is probably the larger context. Uh, I want to talk about the transportation revolution for a moment. Uh, we have the emergence of uh, steamboats, of canals, of uh, railroads, uh, later the telegraph, um, uh, just a variety of ways of linking the different sections of the country together. Uh, we tend to see the emergence, and I'm speaking very generally here, of northeastern manufacturing, southeastern uh, textiles, and midwestern uh, food commodities, uh, wheat and corn and cattle and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, pigs and the transportation revolution will allow for this regional specialization, which is going to emerge here during the Jacksonian time. The uh, Jacksonian, uh, Andrew Jackson will serve two, two terms as president. He runs in 1824 and receives um, a majority of the popular vote, but the Electoral College is, is uh, too close to call. The corrupt bargain, as it has gone down in American history, uh, suggests that John Quincy Adams made a deal with Henry Clay uh, to award Adams the presidency uh, with Clay becoming Secretary of State. Now traditionally the Secretary of State had gone on to become the president in the following administration. So uh, Jackson believes that he's been cheated out of the presidency in 1824, and he will spend those four years from 1824 to 1828 uh, trying to redress those grievances. And of course, he will be successful. So this period sees a, an economic boom as the transportation revolution, revolution takes shape. We see the emergence of the National Road, which runs from uh, Baltimore on the Chesapeake all the way to St. Louis on the uh, Mississippi. Again, this is significant because it links the country together. Uh, it makes the transportation of commodities and goods uh, cheaper and safer and quicker. Uh, this time period also, uh, uh, this Jacksonian era, has about it uh, a term you may have heard in high school called the American system. This is a system of internal improvements uh, promoted uh, by a number of senators, uh, I think of John C. Calhoun and Daniel Webster and uh, Henry Clay, uh, promoting uh, those innovations in transportation that would uh, enhance commerce and make the economic life of the country uh, even more profitable. These, um, this booming economy, let's characterize it a little further. Uh, there's a rise in incomes. People have more to spend. Uh, growth across the board is promoted. Prices rise, and of course when prices rise and demand rises, uh, employment uh, inc increases. There's, um, uh, like I said, there's regional specialization. There's the emergence in the Northeast of a urban working class. Uh, there's the uh, intensification of slave labor in the South. Uh, the cotton gin is introduced around the turn of the 19th century, around uh, 1800 or so, and the cotton gin makes slavery uh, increasingly profitable. So again, we have um, intensification of textiles in the South, intensification of uh, manufacturing in the Northeast, and uh, in food products from the American Midwest. Let me see. Uh, Specialization, uh, again, takes another turn here when you come to the artisans in the early republic. Artisans who work on something in particular like leather or uh, making furniture or using inlaid glass or specialties. These specialties are going to come under attack now uh, as we move through the Jacksonian era because of the uh, rise of factories and the factory system. Uh, of course, you can buy things cheaper when they're mass produced than you can by paying uh, an artisan uh, a much higher price for the same item. Now, that item may be superior in quality, no doubt, uh, but nevertheless, uh, most consumers will go for the, the lower priced item. 
and mass production makes this possible. Uh, you can see this in today's uh, consumer society. Uh, Americans like to go to Walmart where they can get their oil changed and they get a pedicure and they can buy groceries and uh, get their eyes checked and uh, all under one roof. This of course is quite different uh, from mentalities say such as the French who like the artisan uh, bread and the, the wine from the winemaker and the beef from the butcher instead of buying everything uh, sort of at the lowest common denominator. Uh, there's going to be a movement from the farm to the cities here in the Jacksonian era. Uh, remember on the farm uh, you're not paid a wage. Uh, you have the loving embrace of your family. Uh, you have food and shelter, um, but you're not paid a wage. So you're going to see increasingly people leaving the farm to go to cities uh, to get a wage paying job with uh, a paycheck. The Jacksonian era is also characterized by uh, an expanding suffrage and expanding democracy. Uh, the vote is going to be extended to virtually all white men. Uh, previously, white men with property had uh, enjoyed the suffrage. This is going to be extended further and further. Now, of course, Native Americans, slaves, women are all excluded from this expanding democracy. But nevertheless, this is um, uh, quite a change uh, from the uh, the Federalist idea in the early Republic that only the best people uh, need participate. Uh, there's going to be dramatic expansion westward again under the uh, during this Jacksonian era. Uh, so uh, what was it that Jefferson said about uh, Americans extending an empire of liberty? Uh, well here, here we see it as Jackson is going to remove um, Indians from the east of the Mississippi to the west of the Mississippi, uh, specifically the, um, uh, the Cherokee uh, will be removed. This will allow southern um, uh, cotton cultivation to expand. It will allow southerners to reap the benefits of the gold that's discovered in Dahlonega, Georgia. It will allow the um, state of Georgia to uh, gain access to the Tennessee River, and we'll talk about Cherokee Indian removal uh, at a later time. Andrew Jackson himself epitomized uh, this Jeffersonian ideas of um, small government, of um, individual virtue, of republicanism. He sought to limit uh, the size of government. He sought to uh, challenge laws that enhance the power of government. Um, he had a running uh, battle with the Bank of the United States and would lead a, a campaign um, uh, to destroy the Bank of the United States. Again, seeing centralized power in the hands of a few as dangerous for the American people's liberty. In the case of the Bank of the United States, of course, uh, he saw economic power uh, concentrated into the hands of its director, uh, Mr. Biddle, and he sought to uh, diminish the power of this bank and to spread uh, financial power across the states instead of it being centralized. So Jackson is a, a, a perfect example of republicanism in action. And uh, Jackson uh, saw himself as a disciple of Thomas Jefferson. A couple of big issues during the Jacksonian time, and we'll take one of these up in more detail later, uh, is the tariff and the nullification crisis uh, born in South Carolina. Uh, the tariff has been a long-running issue in American history. Of course, this goes all the way back to Hamilton and Jefferson again. We've discussed this earlier. Hamilton uh, uh, created the tariff as Secretary of the Treasury in order to fund uh, this new government led by George Washington. Uh, the tariff, of course, um, protects domestic manufacturing from foreign competition by artificially raising the price of imported goods. This has always been a bone of contention between North and South, North being more industrial, seeking uh, protection of its manufacturing. The South, of course, uh, angry about the tariff because it raises the prices of those items that they purchase um, from the Europeans. 
So this is going to uh, become a full-blown crisis here in the early uh, 1830s as South Carolina will seek to nullify federal law, that is the tariff, and threaten secession. So the tariff crisis we'll talk about at a later time. The, uh, the crisis over um, uh, the Cherokee and Indian removal, we'll save that for a separate lecture because it takes a bit of time to go through. Uh, let me conclude this lecture by talking a little bit about Jackson personally. He was called Old Hickory um, because according to legend he was tough as a hickory stick. Uh, of course he had gained fame during and after the Revolution and especially uh, at the Battle of New Orleans where his, uh, his militia and uh, regular troops fought off uh, a serious assault by the British Army. Uh, he uh, was an Indian fighter uh, he fought the Cretes in uh, western Georgia, eastern Alabama, uh, the Seminoles in Florida. Jackson, like Jefferson, could never seem to quite make up his mind about proper Indian policy for the United States. On the one hand, um, he bought into the Jeffersonian idea of assimilation, whereby the Indians would become more like white Christians, abandon the ways, their traditional ways, or traditional culture, and uh, try to assimilate into American society. On the other hand, Jackson realized, or at least made the argument, that the Indians, in order to survive as a culture, would have to be moved, would have to be relocated west of the Mississippi. Um, with the argument that otherwise uh, they would be overrun by the whites and would not have a chance of surviving uh, as a distinct culture. So there's a bit of a contradiction here, as you can well see, either assimilate or be removed or be annihilated by white culture. Again, we'll look at this in more detail when we talk about Cherokee removal. Jackson himself, um, um, had a number of uh, encounters, political encounters that were troublesome, and uh, some personal encounters as well. He fought a duel like uh, very much in the way of, Jeff uh, Bear of uh, Hamilton and Burr. Uh, legend has it, and I think this has something to do with a horse race, and Jackson um, uh, challenged a man to a duel. I can't remember the details, they're not important. But what is important, because it lends uh, to the legend of Andrew Jackson, is that during this duel, he was shot. The bullet penetrated uh, his left side and uh, lodged very close to his heart. Now, when men fight these duels, they don't uh, stand face to face at 10 paces. They stand uh, sideways. This, of course, diminishes the target that your opponent has to shoot at. Uh, you don't want to get hit in the gut or the chest, so you turn sideways, hoping the bullet uh, will hit you in a non-lethal spot. Uh, this bullet lodged near Jackson's heart. It knocked him down. He's bleeding. He has to be, uh, you would think, in shock. Nevertheless, uh, he rises to his feet, uh, aims, fires, and kills his opponent. Um, this, of course, lends credence uh, to the legend of Andrew Jackson's toughness, uh, old hickory, tough as a hickory stick. So we're not finished with Jackson. Um, we're going to talk about the antebellum South, which is part of the Jacksonian era. We're going to talk about the uh, Nat Turner Rebellion, which takes place in the 1830s. Uh, we'll talk about Cherokee removal, and we'll say a few words about the nullification crisis, which also takes place in the early 1830s. Uh, but we'll save those for next time. Thank you.